Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And today's episode is all about gospel reliability. When I travel and speak, some of the most common questions I receive have to do with whether or not we can trust the Bible. How do we know we have the right books of the Bible? How do we know when they're dated or who wrote them? Were they written by eyewitnesses? Do we have an accurate copy of what they even wrote? And how can we know that they even told the truth about the events that happened in the first century anyway. Well, today's episode, we tackle every single one of those questions with Dr. Peter Williams, who is the principal and CEO of Tyndale House Cambridge. Um, he's educated at the University of Cambridge. He has his uh, PhD in the study of ancient languages related to the Bible. He's a lecturer, itinerant speaker, and so much rich information to share with you today. So without any further ado, here's Dr. Peter Williams. All right, Dr. Peter Williams, so honored to have you on the show. I have been following your work for a very long time, even all the way back to my faith crisis. I remember coming across some of your videos on slavery in the Bible, which were very helpful to me. So thank you so much for being here. Great to be with you. I'd love for you to start out by just telling us a little bit about yourself. For anyone who's unfamiliar with you, you are a New Testament scholar, and you have an interesting story about you grew up in the church. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm 53, married to Catherine for 27 years. We've got two adult children. And um, my background was uh, I, I went to a, a state school where I was um, able to do Greek and Latin at school, which is really special. I was in a Christian family and I went w wanting to become a Bible translator. So I actually went to university uh, to study languages like Hebrew and Aramaic that would help me um, access the original of the Bible. And in university, I encountered people who um, had uh, um, systems of, I would say, unbelief about the Bible. Uh, and uh, that sent me in some quite earnest uh, questioning and doubt even. Uh, and uh, God brought me through that. But I, through that, I thought there's a real need actually for uh, Bible scholars who take a positive view about uh, what's written. So that's what I'm seeking to do. So taking a positive view of what's written is an interesting way to put it, because that isn't the dominant expression of biblical scholarship these days, is it? Well, I mean, I think lots of people, even some skeptics, would see themselves as taking a positive view of what's written. Right. Um, uh, that's the way they see it. Um, so we, we can we can debate with them about that. But what I mean is that uh, scripture is true. Uh, and that's uh, that's something that's galvanized my life. And so for the last 30 plus years, I've been um, involved in biblical scholarship of one form or another, and I'm looking to raise up people who uh, trust the Bible and want to serve the church in helping people understand the Bible. And mention, uh, you mentioned debate. It, am I remembering correctly that you've debated Bart Ehrman? I've done it a couple of times. Yeah, once as a audio only and, and then uh, also once as a video. So that's quite an experience because he's, he's a very good debater. Yes. Yeah, he is. I, I And one of the things in studying deconstruction, which is kind of in my wheelhouse of studying progressive Christianity and deconstruction, he's kind of a hero in both of those worlds among progressive Christians and deconstructionists. Was there a particular uh, maybe challenge? What was the most challenging thing he brought up for you when you debated him, would you say? I, mean, I don't find any of the points that he makes actually challenging as such. Um but I think that he speaks in a way which really captures a cultural moment. So mm. what's happening in the US is that people are on the whole more turning away from Christian belief away, uh, away towards something more skeptical. And he, of course, is within that narrative. So he, at least from age 16 to his early 20s, was a, a believer of some sorts. And he can say, look, I've been there. I've turned away from it. And that's a very powerful thing, which when you're brought up just in a Christian family, you're not able to offer quite the same cultural counter narrative. Uh, he's also just very fast in terms of, if you like, throwing balls at people and you, you have to catch them. Uh, and so I, I thought I, I, I caught most of the balls that he uh, threw, maybe all of them. Uh, but if you've got a situation where uh, one set of beliefs is easier within a wider culture. Uh, I think he's got the easier job, if you mm. like, uh, yeah. because saying, well, um, 
you know, prove that any of it happened, show that any of it happened. I'm just a skeptic. And that can sound very plausible to uh, people. That doesn't mean that if you are able to slow down and look at each of his points that they really stack up. I think many of them don't. Yeah. Well, I want to talk today about the Gospels and the reliability of the Gospels, because I think that is such a core issue for a lot of people, and especially today when people are on social media and they're seeing TikTok videos and Instagram videos of people, quote unquote, debunking the Bible. And a lot of that comes down to the Gospels. And so Mm -hmm. one of, I, I would say there's probably five books that I recommend to people when they have various questions. And one of those books is your book, Can We Trust the Gospels, especially if there's a question about New Testament reliability or or how how do we know that we have the right books of the Bible? What about all the contradictions that people say are in there? What about the mistakes in the manuscripts? And of course, we know these are not mistakes. We call them variants. But people are really trying to catch up, I think, with a lot of this. So I want to focus on that today. But I do want to ask you, why did you focus? focus your study in this particular book simply on the Gospels and maybe not the broader question of the New Testament? Right. So um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I was thinking there was a previous book uh, about 50 years before I wrote mine by F.F. F. Bruce, the New Testament documents, are they reliable? And I was trying to write a book like that, uh, but different. So he covered the entire New Testament. I just covered the Gospels. But part of it was... Um, well, I, I felt I knew more about the Gospels. I also felt that they are, in some sense, more central uh, to establishing uh, things about Jesus Christ historically. Uh, and so I wanted to write a book like that. But above, above all, what, what's true about his book and also about my book is they are short. And actually, there are lots of good books that are longer. I mean, I, I do like uh, Craig Blomberg's book, uh, the historical reliability of the Gospels, but it's quite a bit longer. It's quite a bit more technical. So I was trying to write for people who this may be the first book they've read. I try and use no technical language, or if I do, I'm going to introduce it over time. So uh, that would be a reason to omit those things. But I think obviously you can make write a very good defense of the letters in the New Testament, uh, um, the book of Acts, and and of course the book of Revelation. Right. And it seems to me that if we have the words of Jesus in the Gospels, then, you know, Jesus, of course, had a lot to say about the Old Testament. He had a lot to say about a lot of things. And so that can help kind of form a baseline, in other words, of, you know, how we should view the whole Bible, perhaps. Um, But I want to ask you, you know, through a few questions, because as I mentioned earlier, the main questions I'm getting, especially when I go to women's conferences and I speak there, is women are wanting to know what you know, how do we know we have the right books of the Bible? So that's kind of the first question. But then even if we had the right books, or, you know, if you could even prove that or know that, there seems to be two questions in my mind when it comes to the New Testament and specifically the Gospels. And that's, number one, do we have an accurate copy of what they actually wrote? Um, And then if we do have an accurate copy, how do we know they told the truth? And so I'd love to walk through some of those questions to help our audience just understand a a broad overview of why we know that we can trust the Gospels. Let's start with that first question. And and of course, this is going to extend to more broadly the New Testament, but how do we know we have the right books? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things behind that question that's uh, working away in people's minds is the idea that sometime after Christianity had got going, there were lots and lots of books milling around and some people sort of chose from between them and decided on these four. And of course, that's that's what you get in the Da Vinci Code, but it's where you get elsewhere. And that just misunderstands the situation really, really badly. Uh, So with the four Gospels, they are just before all the other Gospels, even a skeptic like Bart Ehrman agrees on that. But also, there's this idea that gradually over time, Gospels get more authority. Uh, uh, and that that's how these guys won out. But that's quite wrong. Look at the text of, say, Matthew's Gospel. And the opening verse says that it is it calls it the book of the genealogy, using the phrase in Greek that is the book of Genesis. So if you've got um, Jews at the time of Jesus already believe that Genesis is a book from God, and Matthew is saying it's the same sort of book. And then it's got a genealogy, just like you would have in Genesis 5, Genesis 11. It's saying, I'm the same sort of book. John's gospel begins in the beginning, just like Genesis begins. So it's telling you it's the same sort of book. Um, Luke's gospel begins like First Samuel with this barren couple. Uh, there's a child and well, more, more than one. Uh, and, and there's a poem. And that's just like First Samuel. First Samuel scripture, Luke is saying, hey, I'm the same sort of thing. 
And Mark is telling you, it begins, well, Elijah's back. Well, last time we had Elijah, there was scripture. So I think all four of them are claiming to be scripture. And so you have this uh, question of their testimony. You can't say, well, they're sort of half true. They are claiming to be books from God. So either they really are from God or they are fakes of a an immoral kind. So that that's where I think this idea that they're somehow somewhere in the middle and there are lots of these books that are somehow in the middle doesn't work. Then you can look at it from the other angle. People say, well, I've, they've heard of, say, the Gospel of Thomas. Should the Gospel of Thomas be in the Bible? Well, the thing is, even the Gospel of Thomas says it shouldn't be in the Bible. The opening line of it says, these are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which did a student Thomas wrote down. So what's it telling you? It's telling you there's a public thing that's been set out elsewhere. Um, and if you want the inside scoop, you have to come to the Gospel of Thomas. So it's not saying you can put the Gospel of Thomas alongside any other Gospels. It's saying it's the replacement for all of those. They're just the public message. This is the inside scoop. So uh, the idea that you could put that in a Bible sitting alongside other things doesn't make any sense. But you can also see that it's um, a rather devious way of beginning things, because whereas the four Gospels are giving you what Jesus taught publicly, this is claiming, and it's written quite a bit later, of course, it's claiming, well, you know, you mustn't trust any of the thing that you hear from all those witnesses in public. He only really told the real truth to this one guy, Thomas, and that's what I'm letting you know, which is all very convenient. And there's another gospel that's similar, the gospel of Judas. And again, you can't have the gospel of Judas and the gospel of Thomas together. They are mutually exclusive. Um, and that is Jesus only told the real scoop to Judas Iscariot. So that, that's where just people have misunderstood what these things are. And popular narratives like you get in the Da Vinci Code are, um, yeah, helping people think that way, that there was this whole raft of books and somehow some powerful people in the church said, we want those ones because they're going to get us more money or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's also this this idea that I, I hear quite a bit that, if you go back to the earliest Christianity, it was just incredibly diverse theologically. Like they had all these different views of what the gospel was and who Jesus was. And it was really just the theological winners of the battles that got to write the New Testament and specifically the gospels about Jesus' life. H how could we respond to a claim like that? Well, I think in all four gospels, we've got this very high view of Jesus where, uh, say, in Matthew's gospel, he is treated as... Uh, the, well, the son of man who sits on his throne and judges the nations. Well, that's something that God does. Or in Mark's gospel, he forgives sins. This is something that God does. So you go through each of the gospels and um, they have this very, very high view of Jesus. It's not something that develops over time. So I think there is this unity around Jesus being absolutely uh, a remarkable, exceptional person uh, but not just that, actually far more than that. Uh, and that's something that's that's there all along. Now, later on, I think you get lots of debates where you've got groups, we call them now heretical groups, that say things like, well, maybe he wasn't fully human or maybe he wasn't fully God. But I think those things um, are things that come along later. You in, in the Gospels themselves, you've got Jesus presented as doing things that only God does. Yeah. And it, I think it was Gary Habermas who was maybe quoting somebody else, but he was saying the earliest Christology is the highest Christology. It's just, it's, if you look at the Gospels in the earliest, even some of those proto creeds, you have Jesus being uh, presented as, you know, Jesus is Lord. You have all of these, uh, this high Christology from a very early point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about authorship, because one of the things I see a lot in skeptical spaces is claims like the Gospels could not have been written by eyewitnesses. Uh, this, these were written by decades later by people who were just informed by other people. Uh, what do we make of a claim like that? How can the average person process that, that idea and have an answer for that? Well, I, mean, I think there are two different issues. One is the date of the Gospels and two is who, who they came from. Now, yesterday I had a very happy day because it was my granny's 104th birthday. Wow. And uh, she's in quite good shape and we can get memories from uh, 80 years or more earlier. 
uh, and at 90, yes, in, in fact. So uh, it's all uh, the, the question of how long ago can things be accurately remembered, certainly within an entire lifetime. Um, but the four Gospels have these names on them, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And let's start with the middle ones, Mark and Luke. They would be nobodies if it weren't for their Gospels. Uh, so Mark, uh, hardly known outside the Gospel. There are a couple of mentions of him in the New Testament. And Luke, again, would hardly be known if it weren't for the, the Gospel and the Book of Acts. So you can't say that those names were put on artificially to give them more credence. It's a bit like saying that the name J.K. Rowling was put on the Harry Potter series in order to sell it. No, it wasn't. Uh, she was not known at the time. Um, so I would say that those two names are very solid there. Uh, and uh, if Luke really is a doctor um, before he's traveling with Paul in the 50s AD, that gives you some sort of time limit for when that gospel's written. If Mark is the interpreter of Peter, um, again, that gives you some sort of time limit on when it's written. Matthew and John um, are titled as by people who are some of the 12 disciples of, of Jesus, Matthew, the tax collector, John, the beloved disciple. So I think uh, the claim there is that these are eyewitness um, accounts. And of course, they do have the longest speeches given by Jesus in, in either case of, of those, that the eyewitness ones. Um, so I'd say with Mark and, and Luke, they're based on eyewitnesses. Uh, with Matthew and John, they actually are eyewitnesses. And there are some very interesting agreements you get between uh, Matthew and John uh, against uh, the other ones. For instance, in the resurrection account where Jesus um, uh, tells the woman or Mary to go and tell Jesus's brothers. And that's not something he often speaks about, but it's it's there in both of those Gospels. There are other things like that. Um, and Matthew has, well, if it comes from a tax collector, it certainly has more mentions of money than any other Gospel, uh, whether it's the treasure of the wise men, um, the parable of the talents, the, um, the paying of the temple tax, and so on. Uh, it really fits with it, coming having come from a tax collector. John has got incredible knowledge of uh, Judea and Galilee. Uh, again, it, it, it really fits. So I would say that the reason people don't like the idea of this coming from Jesus is because that, that has really awkward implication for certain worldviews. To have an eyewitness recording miracles, uh, that's pretty uncomfortable. Seven Weeks Coffee is the coffee Planned Parenthood hates, and that is because Seven Weeks Coffee is unapologetically and boldly Christian and pro-life. That's baked into their name. The name Seven Weeks is coming from the idea that when the baby is in the womb, at seven weeks old, it's the size of a coffee bean. And this is also when you can first detect the heartbeat. And that is the heartbeat of Seven Weeks Coffee because they have raised and donated over $380,000 to pro-life groups. And these are primarily pregnancy centers across the United States. And they support and partner with over 850 of those pro-life organizations. So you can know that when you order your amazing coffee, by the way, the quality is just off the charts. It's shade-grown, mold-free, low acid, no pesticides. And you know that when you order from seven weeks, 10% of your purchase is going to these pro-life groups across the country. And they have a goal. Let's help them get there. Let's help seven weeks get to this goal of giving over 400,000 to pro-life groups. They've gotten up to 380. They want to get to four. Let's help them out. So when you go to sevenweekscoffee.com, you're also going to get an additional 15% off of every order when you subscribe and use my code ALISA. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com coffee.com use my code alisa again that's sevenweekscoffee.com use my code alisa yeah so that's kind of that anti supernatural bias that can come in there and cause that maybe some hyper skepticism i think if the if the supernatural element were not there at all people wouldn't have a difficulty given the amount of evidence we have say with john's gospel of saying oh yes that was written by Mm. a student about his teacher. People wouldn't have a problem with that if it weren't for the remarkable content. Uh, but if, if, if it's just the external evidence you have, it's better than you have for all sorts of other books because you actually have, in the case of John's Gospel, 
Um, Irenaeus, who is two generations away from John, so he quoting um, Polycarp uh, or say, uh, saying he hears from Polycarp, who hears directly from John, and this thing in front of Irenaeus sitting in France um, actually came from uh, John, the disciple of Jesus. That's not the sort of thing you have for any of Plato's dialogues, for instance. So it's, I would say, better attested than lots of classical literature we take for granted that Plato can write about Socrates. Not that he is, not that people naively assume that everything he says Socrates said that Socrates actually said, but they actually uh, treat it with some seriousness. Right. Well, let's talk about dating and maybe why it matters. What you, I, you had a whole section in your book about even how skeptical scholars will date the Gospels. First of all, why does the dating even matter? And, and how do you date the Gospels? And how can we think about yeah. that question? So I, I, I tend to date these by generations rather than decades. So, you know, whether they're written in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, isn't so, so important for me as uh, that they are from the first generation. And I think we can see from the quality of information that they are from that. So whether you have throughout Jesus's stories, and I've just been writing recently on Jesus's stories, you have the hallmarks of one particular mind um, across the Gospels. Uh, so that makes sense if it's not being generated in the second or third generation of Christians. Likewise, you've got the various genius sayings of Jesus um, just one-liners, if you say, if you like. And again, they seem to be first generation. You've got the ge geographical details, the knowledge of culture. That makes more sense in the first generation than later, because if Christianity spread across the Roman Empire, then um, there were more Christians away from the land of Jesus uh, at a later stage. It's the earlier stage. They're all confined uh, to uh, Judea and, and Galilee and so on. And so that's where that level of knowledge makes most sense in the first generation, or the fact that they're so Jewish. So over, well, relatively quickly, Christianity spreads to non-Jews, to Gentiles. And that means that the proportion of Jews amongst Christians is being dil diluted all the time. And yet what we can see is these four Gospels are incredibly Jewish um, documents in terms of the uh, culture they are reflecting and re reporting. Uh, and that makes most sense early on, uh, after uh, 50 or 100 years of Christianity getting going, it makes far less sense. Mm. So I mentioned earlier that there's sort of two questions on the table when we think about, or at least when I was thinking this through for myself a while back, and that's, do we have an accurate copy? Because when I was in my skeptical progressive class, you know, the, the pastor was saying things like, you know, we don't even have, we don't even know what they wrote because he, he said there's hundreds of thousands of mistakes between the manuscript tradition. I mean, we're not even talking about whether or not they told the truth. We're talking about, do we even have a copy of what they had? And this was actually, for me personally, one of the most rattling things to my own personal no. faith because I had built my whole life on the Bible and then thinking, well, I don't even have an accurate copy of what the Bible even is. So how can we approach that question and think that through? Well, there are lots, lots of things to say about that. Um, I would say you've got to be, make sure people don't play mathematical tricks on you. Mm. So if you imagine that there were, instead of just eight billion people on the planet, so there were eight trillion or something, and everyone were to copy out the Bible, um, then by hand, uh, there would be more mistakes in the manuscripts than if there are only eight billion or only eight million people copying them out. Would that mean that overall you were less certain about uh, the text that you were copying? Not at all. Uh, if you have 80,000 people in a stadium seeing an event, they may have differences in their accounts of it. If you only have one person seeing it, there won't, won't be no differences. Uh, does that mean that something witnessed by 80,000 people is somehow less certain than something witnessed by one? So that's where I think people can play these mathematical tricks. And Bart Ehrman does that when he starts bringing in the number of copying mistakes that people have made over history, uh, which is really a factor of how many scribes there are um, uh, and how many copies you have. That, that's the sort of thing that will feed into that, not the level of actual confidence you have in, in the text of the Bible. Now, what I'd say is look at the, say, opening verses of John's gospel. What's striking there is that we have lots of manuscripts and they don't have significant differences. Yes, there's a bit of difference over how you spell the name John, whether it's with one or two N's and, and this sort of thing. But you have uh, huge 
unity across large stretches of, of text. Uh, and so what I want to say is that this idea that we can't know is uh, a bit, yes, it's a bit strange. I've got a hearing difficulty. So sometimes when I um, listen to a talk, I miss some words. Does that mean I can't say anything of what the talk was about? No, it doesn't. I, I missed a few words. Often, often people will miss someone's words or they might miss something that's going on in the film. Again, it doesn't um, mean that they can't understand anything. And so I think there's this slightly strange way people approach the Bible, whereas if there's one uncertain word or a word they don't understand, somehow this undermines everything because they think of the Bible like a magic spell. Uh, hmm. And I often, and sorry, I'm going to use another Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but but uh, when you say diagonally rather than diagonally, you end up in the wrong place. Uh, yeah. And that, that's where people see it as like that. Whereas in fact, you've got a huge uh, confidence that it doesn't matter what language you're reading the Bible in. The stories are in the same order. They have basically the same points. I mean, show it's hard to, for anyone to show me a copy of the Bible in which it's somehow making a fundamentally different point. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's there's a lot of confidence we can have about things. The other way I'd look at it in terms of analogy would be there, um, the ancient economy depended on copying. So just as we have cell phones nowadays, and I mean, even, even um, now in this conversation we're having online, relies on uh, you seeing and hearing a copy of me. And I have no idea how many times uh, my audio has been copied before you hear it. But um, we, we know that our society is built on that. That's the same with ancient scribes. Ancient scribes were there and their job was to copy. And that they normally did it very successfully. So we have delivery trucks nowadays in modern society. And without them, things wouldn't work. And of course, we know theoretically that a delivery truck can go to the wrong address. Something might not be delivered. But we also know that in the overwhelming majority of cases in our society, delivery trucks arrive where they're supposed to. And in the overwhelming majority of cases of copying in an ancient society, things got copied correctly. So this idea that um, somehow things got lost over time doesn't make a huge amount of sense. We also have copies all around the place. So there's not really one central control within Christianity that could um, manipulate everything. So even when you get, say, powerful popes in Rome, they don't control what goes on in uh, Constantinople. Uh, in Constantinople, they're not controlling what goes on in all the different monasteries as copies are made. Things are being copied in lots of different countries and even in different languages. So we've got the New Testament, not just in the original Greek. We've got it in early Latin. We've got it in Syriac, Coptic, Gothic. And you go on through time, uh, Armenian, um, Georgian, Anglo-Saxon, Arabic. And, and the idea that anyone was in a position to change all of these copies doesn't make any sense at all. So I think you can have a huge amount of confidence uh, that the uh, New Testament, the Gospels, have been well handed down to us. Well, today is Father's Day, and it is the absolute last day to buy the new King Cut box from Good Ranchers. So this is a one-time purchase that's full of thick-cut bone-in ribeyes, center-cut filet mignons, and thick-cut bone-in New York strips. And this is all sourced from local family farms and aged 21 days to perfection. This is your last day to get it. So go to GoodRanchers.com to pick up that one-time-only King Cut box. But one of the things I love about Good Ranchers is that they have very high-level levels of transparency. That means you know exactly where your meat is coming from, and they are totally committed to using only American raised and harvested meat. So that way, when you get your grass-fed beef, better than organic chicken, wild-caught seafood, and heritage breed pork, you know that you're supporting local American farms, and they are totally transparent with their practices, and I absolutely love it. Now, right now, when you subscribe to Good Ranchers, you're going to get free bacon for life. This is not just free bacon in the first box or for a year. This is free bacon for the life of your subscription. I've never seen them offer something quite this amazing. So 
Go to GoodRanchers.com. Look at the different boxes that they have to offer. Use my code ALISA to get that King Cut box for the one-time purchase. And then if you want to subscribe, you're going to get that free bacon for the life of your subscription. But if you needed any other reason to support Good Ranchers, they're not only great supporters and partners of my show, but they support the paralyzed veterans of America. So every order saves American farms and supports American veterans. So change the way you buy meat today. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use my code Alisa to claim your free bacon for life. Again, that's GoodRanchers.com. Use my code Alisa. And I think for a lot of Christians, you mentioned there might, you know, there could be an uncertain word between manuscripts or something along those lines. I think what catches a lot of Christians is the idea of, well, if there's an uncertain word or if there's even a variant between manuscripts that scholars even today aren't entirely in agreement about which goes back to the original, what does that mean for the Bible being without error? How do how do we process the question of the Bible being yeah. authoritative and without error if there are these uncertain words between manuscripts? Yeah, so one of the things we need to recognize is the word Bible has two different meanings. Uh, and so it's one of those words that can trick you out. So uh, you can hold a physical copy of a Bible in your hand, and it's a physical thing. But Bible just simply means, and it's ori- uh, the original word, Biblia, means books. Um, and the Christian claim is that these books, or the scriptures, as that's more, they're more historically called, are books that God has given. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone, uh, you know, if they try and copy something out by hand, will not make a mistake. Um, God hasn't guaranteed that all people at all times will have a perfect copy of his books. So I'll give you an example of this from scripture, which is there is this book of the law in the time of Josiah, which has been lost in the temple. It's the main uh, scriptures and it's forgotten about. And then Hilkiah finds it. So uh, the Bible could even go missing. That's, uh, you know, entirely. Now, I don't think it's going to happen. There are so many uh, copies around, but God's not under any obligation to give people a perfect copy in their hands. So what that means, but it's actually, it's much more interesting than that because um, the Bible is this very, very powerful thing from God and it multiplies. The, it, the, it says in Acts chapter six, the word of God is fruitful and multiplying, just as it says in Genesis one to humans, be fruitful and multiply. That it, um, the more it's translated, the more it's copied, the more the word of God is going out. It's bearing fruit. And it's a very powerful thing that even if you have a bad translation is powerful in carrying God's message forward. Um, so. Uh, a let's say a bad translation in the Middle Ages might have been in Latin, might have had some copying errors. Does that mean the word of God was somehow bound so it couldn't transform lives and transform society? No, not at all. Uh, And that is the really great thing that the Bible is not like a magic spell where if you get one word wrong, it somehow uh, doesn't work at all. Actually, the the Bible is something which is powerful so that even Uh, In our weak human context, where sometimes we misunderstand bits and so on, it's doing its work. Um, And so our claim is that God never lies. God always tells the truth. He has given words to his people. Those words are preserved in copies. I don't think there's any evidence that any word of God has been lost, not a single one, uh, I would say. Uh, whether that's in the Old or New Testament. People can debate that, but I don't think there's any firm evidence um, of that. Um, And then uh, beyond that, we can say we have really good copies uh, that we are really debating about very small things about whether it's this word or that word, this sense or that sense. Um, But even if we didn't know those things, that would just simply a statement about us, about our ignorance. It's not a statement about what God has given. That's good. Are you comfortable giving a percentage of how accurately you think the New Testament's been copied? So I don't want to get involved in percentages uh, because that will depend on your starting points. Uh, but what I would say is I don't think a single word of the New Testament is not in the manuscripts that we have. 
Very good. Yeah, I like that. I think I remember hearing you say that in debate. In that sense, I, I'm, uh, in that sense I'm, I'm going to go for 100 uh, percent of the words that God gave are in the copies we have. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't some extra words in or doesn't mean I always know whether, if you like, um, uh, you know, Jesus said either or either. Uh, there are things where, where right. we, we don't know. Um, uh, but that that's okay. Uh, we are working towards that. And in fact, I've got here a uh, Greek New Testament that I helped edit. Uh, it's with Crossway and Cambridge University Press. And we, yeah, we've gone through letter by letter uh, and this. And uh, yeah, we've taken a great interest in exactly how you spell things, exactly how you lay it out. In fact, I'd even say we know more than we need to, because hmm. uh, I would say we know something um, about some of the layout of the early manuscripts, even though uh, God's under no obligation to let us know that. Very good. Well, so that kind of settles the <clears throat> the copying question. But we, you know, in theory, you could have an accurate copy of a lie, or you could have an accurate copy of of something that got all the historical details wrong. So, uh, what what are some maybe some of the reasons that you you have for trusting that what they actually reported is actually true? Yeah, so the most famous person alive at the time of, uh, of Christ was the emperor, of course, Tiberius. And we got four accounts of his life. Uh, and three of the four are definitely further away from the time of Tiberius than the Gospels are from the time of Jesus. And they actually um, don't give you as much variety uh, of perspective on uh, Tiberius's words as you get with Jesus. So with Jesus, you get him giving long talks publicly and privately, back and forth dialogues, short pithy sayings, um, questions, also um, giving his parables, all sorts of different ways in which he uh, speaks, uh, sometimes to crowds, sometimes to Pharisees, sometimes to Sadducees. Uh, there are all sorts of different contexts. Uh, sometimes he'll be at a meal, sometimes he'll be outside and so on. And, and that gives you lots of different ways in which you can test coherence. You can say, uh, is there a coherent mind, say, behind all of these things? And you, you find that there is. There, there, there's someone who's obviously um, very um, insightful on the human condition. So when you have in John's gospel and only in John's gospel, the truth will set you free. I mean, that's an amazing thing I call a meme. Uh, mm -hmm. It is an amazing insight on life. And uh, whoever came up with that deserves to be famous. But then you also find uh, over in Matthew's gospel, uh, things like um, uh, do unto others what you have them do to you. Um, and then you have um, in John's gospel, a related idea, but a different idea, which is love one another amongst the disciples as I have loved you. And they're both very, very challenging love ethic. Um, and uh, they're both brilliant in terms of the way uh, they, they, they come out. And you're finding this throughout the Gospels. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Wow, that's very insightful politically. I mean, that's a huge thing to think about uh, when you're thinking about uh, the modern world or the poor you will always have with you. Wow, that's a really insightful thing because it works at the level of, wh why would that be the case? Well, it's something about, it's a statement about the human nature um, and why that will always uh, be the case, that uh, humans, uh, yes, w w will always create a situation in which there will be poverty. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously often it's it's, richer people creating that that situation but jesus has the insight in that situation where that that's uh, going on or um out of the heart come the various evil things it's not external pressures some people say oh it's all about say political systems that that, that cause evil and they don't recognize it comes from within so time and time again you've got these amazingly insightful things on life turn the other cheek um uh, judge not that you be not judged. Whatever measure you use, we use back on you. And I could just go on and on with these amazing sound bites that Jesus has across the Gospels. And you start saying, uh, well, who could have invented that? You'd need to have, uh, if if it was one of the Gospel writers, that won't explain it because there are 
different sayings in other gospels. So do you have two gospel writers or three who are all really clever at coming up with sayings? Um, that doesn't make any sense at all. It's a very complicated explanation. So it's not that I can prove, say, that Jesus said all those things. I can simply say that's a far simpler and better explanation than any of the alternatives. Um, so we, we don't have cameras from around the Sea of Galilee at the time of Jesus. In fact, we don't even have many other historical records. Josephus is um, whizzing through um, the period at about 500 words per year. So that, in other words, that's all the words he would give to describe on average a year. So there's very little written about the time. But then you test the Gospels and you say, but this really does stack up uh, that this person really said these things at this time. Any alternative is going to get you into a quagmire of uh, difficulties and secondary hypotheses that you're just um, inventing to prop up your original skepticism. Mm. Let's talk about undesigned coincidences, because this yeah. is uh, some really fascinating uh, arguments that are made in, for the reliability of the Gospels. Talk about what that is and then maybe an, an example or two. Yeah, so undesigned coincidences have been things that have been talked out about for over 200 years as the sort of subtle agreements you get between two different narratives such that uh, you can't say that the two writers or one of the writers has put something in in order to make the story look authentic because firstly, you sort of need two to tango. Um, and if, even if one tried to fit their narrative in a subtle way with another, that um, uh, it, the danger is no one would even spot it. So to give you an example from the Old Testament, you have this story about how Abraham doesn't have Isaac until he's really late on uh, in, in his life, about 100 years old. Um, and then you find separately that Isaac marries Rebecca. And Rebecca is actually his first cousin once removed. She's actually one generation lower uh, than Isaac. So her, her ancestors have managed to fit in an extra generation. Um, and that makes total sense uh, that if uh, Abraham didn't have Isaac till really late in his life, that makes sense why he would be marrying a cousin one generation younger. Uh, and so that's the sort of thing that you get. Now, you get that in the Gospels as well, where... For instance, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane in the Synoptic Gospels, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, let this cup pass from me to his father. Then uh, you don't get that same prayer over in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, people come to arrest Jesus. Peter is all for uh, fighting them off. And uh, Jesus says, shall I not drink the cup that's been given me? So in other words, it's like he's got cup on the mind. It's a very odd thing to say in John's gospel otherwise. That's the sort of thing you get when you have extracts from a much larger pool of things that happened. And then you get these subtle agreements uh, that you get between one narrative and another. That's the sort of thing that's happening when people are just truly reporting. Mm. And one of the most fascinating things I learned about from your book was the names and the 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 names, how many names they got right, and mm -hmm. the and and even the frequency of the use of those names. Because it's not like they had Google in the first century where they could look up what was the most popular name in you know twenty nine A.D. It, they're getting all of these things right. Talk about the names because that was so fascinating to me. Yes, yeah, so so names are very interesting. Uh, of course, they differ from country to country. So you've got a different pattern of names between, say, the UK and the US. But even if you go in areas within the US, you're going to be getting different patterns of, of names. Um, and that can depend on all sorts of um, factors and immigration and social trends and and, and just masses of de demographic uh, things. It's the same with Jews. Uh, Jews in Rome, if you look in the catacombs, they have much more Latin and Roman names. If you go down to Egypt, they have a different set of names than what they do in Roman Judea. Uh, and so what you find is that the Gospels have the right names for the time and place of Jesus. So the most popular name amongst the Jews at the time in Jesus' land was Simon. And that's the most popular name inside the Gospels. And then you have this extra thing that with the really popular names, you're far more likely to get a disambiguator, an added extra uh, to make sure you can clarify 
that this is not another person, a bit like how surnames evolved in order to create that clarity. So that's why Jesus has two disciples called Simon, one called Simon Peter, or if you put that in Aramaic, Simon Cephas, uh, or another is called Simon the Zealot, or put that in Aramaic, Simon the Canaanite. Um, so that's happening. Also, um, most popular female name is Mary. So you have Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. And each time you have a Mary, they're inclined to put something extra with that name to clarify which of the various Marys we're talking about. And that's happening in the Gospels with the popular names and not with the less popular names. So names like um, Philip or Andrew or Thomas, they're not getting those extra bits on the whole. And that really fits with uh, what we know about the relative frequency of names at the time of Jesus. Now, we also know that names are phenomenally hard to remember. They're very arbitrary things, and humans struggle with names. And one of the first signs uh, we're going to see as our memories uh, fade with older age is we're forgetting names and so on. We're forgetting labels for things. We watch films. We remember the story. We forget the characters, the names of the characters, very um, much more quickly than we forget the story. And that is because stories are easy to remember and names are about the hardest thing to remember. And so if the Gospels are correctly getting names, that's every reason to think that they can get stories right, because stories are much easier than getting names. That's so fascinating. Are there any other just things you could share about the reliability of the Gospels that stand out to you that somebody might easily be able to commit to memory and share with others? Well, I, I think that when you make up a story, let's say you wanted to make up some historical fiction. Firstly, it's doubtful that historical fiction of the kind we have existed at the time of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. But you'd have to do a lot of research because you have to get the not just the names right, you get the geography right, you have to get the relative number of jobs that people have right, you have to get the words right, um, the particular way people speak in a particular place, you have to get the weather right, you have to get their um, um, financial system correct. Uh, so, and when you start adding all the different things up, it becomes really formidable. So people criticized uh, the Da Vinci Code for getting some of the Paris geography uh, right, uh, wrong, sorry. And, and, you know, someone can make up a story and easily just make some uh, mistakes. And the Gospels are getting things right across the board. So things like where they say um, the land goes up and down, they're using the right verbs to go up and go down. And of course, it's very hilly land. Um, they're using them all at the right place. They're getting the travel times correct. So how long it takes to get from Galilee to Judea, where you have to go through the route that you would use, that you often would uh, go down the Jordan Rift Valley and approach uh, Jerusalem from the east. So therefore you come over the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. That's the sort of stuff they just know. They get that right, that stuff right time and time again. Um, and it's not trivial information. It does, I mean, does, again, it doesn't prove that their um, narratives are correct. What it does show is that at the very least, these authors knew the land they were writing about and they were close enough to the time um, to be able to record things correctly. Mm. I suppose the final question that we could cover, we covered the dating, the authorship, we covered, do we have an accurate copy and how do we know they told the truth? I suppose the the final uh, frontier here, and this is something that comes up quite a bit, of course, especially through people like Bart Ehrman and other skeptical scholars, but that's about these supposed contradictions that we find between the Gospels, and particularly in reference to the resurrection, there's a lot of talk about there being irreconcilable differences. How, how do you approach that question? So, I mean, at, at various levels, and it depends how deeply someone wants to go into this. So firstly, uh, I would say the fact that there are significant differences in the four resurrection accounts, at the very least, should mean that we should admit that they don't all come from one source. Uh, you know, someone's, well, if number two is copying number one and three is copying number two and so on, you wouldn't get the pattern that we have in the Gospels. Then pe what people are saying is, well, there are contradictions about let's say, the number of angels or people wearing really bright, shiny clothes um, at, at the tomb. Well, yes, people wearing really bright, sh shiny clothes are angels. So, that yes, they can be described as man or angel, uh, angels at the time. 
Um, there's no re report of them having wings. So again, you may be tricked by later senses of art about what someone looks like. And often uh, we would report on a conversation we had with several individuals, we might just report that as a, a conversation with one because that's what we're wanting to focus in on. But I'd say fundamentally, I think if you add the four accounts together of the, of the resurrection, you end up having at least six women who go to the tomb. Um, now, do those six women all stick together? Do they all file into the crowded tomb um, together? Or does, do some stay outside and some go in? Do they all hear and see exactly the same thing? What if those, four, uh, those six women uh, relate to four men uh, what they saw uh, firsthand and they haven't all seen the same thing? And what if angels are also allowed to move? Um, th when you start looking at that, you start thinking, actually, um, these accounts aren't as difficult to reconcile as people say. And you look at John's gospel where you might look at it at first and say, well, that's just Mary Magdalene on her own going to the tomb because that's what it first reports. Um, but she comes back and tells the apostles, um, we don't know where they've laid him. Well, that sort mm. of is telling you there's more to the story uh, than on the surface. And then also in John's gospel, uh, the two disciples run off to the tomb and then Mary is back at the tomb, but it never reported when she went back. So there's clearly a lot more going on than is in the narrative. And I think you have exactly the same sort of thing going on in the other other, other accounts. So uh, when you recognize that these are huge condensations of uh, larger sets of events, they actually become more than one way that you can fit them together. So my uncertainty is not um, how they, well, it's more about how, they fit together because I've got multiple routes. It's a bit like you can get to from A to B, uh, you know, more than one way on your GPS. Uh, so I, I think that's that's the way it is. Um, the other thing is, of course, contradictions can easily be a sort of um, point scoring exercise, I suppose, uh, where people will say, you know, you've got all these contradictions in the Bible. And I'd want to say, well, yeah, because Jesus himself taught using contradictions, um, actually deliberately. Uh, as a good teacher of, often does, uh, where he would say things like, you know, the Son of Man didn't come to judge the world, John 3, and also, for judgment, I came into this world. Um, and you get, I, I, I give a whole list of those, particularly from John's Gospel, showing you that the master teacher is using these uh, paradoxes, if you like. Now, why do you use them? Uh, precisely to get people to do a little bit more work and thinking. So in John's gospel, Jesus is using paradoxes. Um, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus asks 90 questions. Um, both of those are ways of making hearers do some work. And I think often what we are is fundamentally lazy. We expect um, uh, that the gospels should do all the work for us, whereas in fact they're an invitation for us to exercise our God-given minds to explore what he's saying to us. I love that. At one time I was teaching a apologetics class to a group of students. And when we were talking about New Testament reliability and specifically contradictions, I asked for four volunteers. And so I got my volunteers and I walked them out of the room so that they couldn't, uh, the people in the room couldn't see what was happening outside of the room. And to the four students outside of the room, I told them a little story. I pointed out some things on the wall. I pointed out just different things and said, said a couple things. And then one by one, I brought them in to tell the group what they experienced outside of the classroom. And they couldn't hear each other tell the story of what happened out there. And every, all four, you would have thought they all four experienced four completely different things because of the details that they gave were different. But I can tell you that every single one of them was telling the whole, they were telling the truth, but there were just certain details that they noticed that were different than details somebody else noticed that could appear to be a contradiction, yeah. but they were all telling the truth. So it would actually yeah. make me more suspicious if all four gospels were exactly unified in every single detail, because that would sound like they all got together and got their story straight. It sounds like a great exercise. I yeah, it was that. It was really, I was nervous. I didn't know if it was going to work, but it worked really well, so it was great. So what I'd love to do, we're about out of time. I'd love you, for you to tell everybody about your new book called The Surprising Genius of Jesus, What the Gospels yeah. Reveal About the Greatest Teacher. 
So it's a similar book uh, in length to my Can We Trust the Gospel? So about three and a half hours to read and trying to write in a simple way. But it really does a deep dive with Jesus's longest story, which is the story of the two sons or the prodigal son, which is all of three minutes long and uh, really showing how that has multiple levels at which it works. Every single word is carefully chosen. Um, I think we can make a case that the whole lot has to come from Jesus. So you've got three minutes of actual recording of Jesus's words, which is rather phenomenal. Um, and that it it's also has deep levels based off um, the Old Testament. So uh, Jesus is speaking in a way uh, to multiple audiences, those who don't know the Bible and those who do simultaneously, which is a very clever thing to do. Anyone who can do mixed ability teaching. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's really just jaw dropping in terms of what Jesus achieves uh, in that story. And having shown it with that story for about half of the book, I then show that in uh, some of the other stories uh, worked out in a little bit less detail. And where can people connect with you online? Are you on Twitter still? I remember I used to be. Yeah, I go under Dr. PJ Williams on lots of social uh, networks. So uh, I'm I sporadic in how active I am, but probably X is the one I use the most. All right. Well, I want to thank my guest, Dr. Peter Williams, and definitely follow on social media. I'm not on Twitter anymore, but when I was, I used to I love the threads that, that Dr. Williams would post about biblical reliability and even just specifics about Bible passages. Also, pick up his book, Can We Trust the Gospels? This is one you're going to want to have two or three copies of, one for yourself and two or three to give away. I've given away this book to many people and recommended it to many people, so it's such a valuable resource. And again, like we said, it's so short, easy to digest, and it's just a power punch of gospel reliability. So pick that up. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. We've got some really great conversations coming up that you're not going to want to miss. And if you're listening on audio platforms, it always helps if you leave a great review and like this on social media, share it out to your friends. And in the meantime, as we pursue Christ, let's keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time. <laughs>